Here's Anthony, Mr. Alan Alda. Hi, how are you? Mr. Alda. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this. I Thank really appreciate it. Thank you for it. doing it. I, I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, Thank absolutely. You very much. I was sir, for the last 20 minutes. I've been circling trying to find you. There's no number out front. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, it could be a little. Uh, it could be a little bit. And then the and then Wade said, "You have arrived at your destination, and there's all these buildings." <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where it was. Yeah, it could be a little. Well, you, I'm glad you had a phone number. <laughs> <laughs> we just got one. I, yeah, I swear yeah, to God, if there weren't a phone number, I'd be knocking on doors at the cleaners. Would you like me on the radio? <laughs> <laughs> All right, morning show with Anthony here on 92.9 and 96.9 EHM. Uh, super excited to have in studio with us a very special guest, Mr. Alan Alda is here. Alan, how are you? I'm great. I'm excited to be here, too. This I, is great. I feel like all these years, me growing up, watching your material, like this was not supposed to happen. Like, this is not right. And all my crew, this wasn't. It's I, funny, too, because you're in the, the, uh, the center of stores in Watermill here. <laughs> <laughs> and I just came in to have my clothes cleaned. <laughs> Typical of most radio stations. We're next to a cleaners and a liquor store. That yeah, seems well, to be the MO. You need one or the other every few minutes. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. Now, listen, I, I could sit here, we could talk about MASH, we could talk about the directing all your material, but I want to focus on what you're doing tonight at Guild Hall, which is your podcast. Right, we're doing a live presentation of the podcast on stage at Guild Hall in East Hampton, and I'm very excited about it, because it's really the first one that where we deliberately do the podcast as a podcast in front of, in front of an audience. Yeah. It's kind of exciting. And I'll be interviewing... Uh, Laura Brown, who's the editor-in-chief of In Style magazine. And I'm really curious about style because I don't have any. <laughs> and I wonder what it is. I don't understand. I don't understand. I've been wearing the same clothes for you know all my life. I don't mean the same kind of clothes. I mean right. the same clothes. <laughs> and every 20 years they come back in style. So I don't get that. How does it work? I have no idea. I'm curious to see what she has to say, too, for that very reason. Yeah, and, and she's a very interesting woman. She's doing interesting things with the magazines, deepening it a little bit. And, and she did an article on me in which the headline was that I was a badass man. I saw, yeah, I saw. And I don't know what that means. I'm so <laughs> out of style. I don't know what it... I said, I thought, I suppose that's a compliment or you wouldn't have put it on. She <laughs> wouldn't have came to do your podcast if yeah, it right, wasn't a compliment. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So I got to find out what that means. And, <laughs> and it must have a deeper meaning than what it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I mean, how does it feel to be like, how do you, how do you, are you first aware of like, oh, Laura thinks you're a badass. Does somebody come tell you? Does she write? No, I saw it in the magazine. You saw it in the <laughs> magazine. <laughs> oh, no, she did tell me. And during the interview, she said, what, I'm calling this a badass man. I didn't realize that she has a series of articles called Badass Woman. Okay. And she picks out women who are, even though it's the magazine is called In Style, these are not necessarily glamorous, right. stylish people. Right. But she she calls them badass for some reason that I don't yet understand <laughs> because they're important people. Right. Well, that's, and they do interesting things. So I guess I'm included in that bunch. That's that's a high honor, I think. Yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah. It's no, nice. Nobody's ever called me a badass for sure. I'll call you one right now. <laughs> You're a badass. <laughs> Thank you. There You're you welcome. go. Alan Alda calling Anthony on the morning show a badass. That's a that's a thrill. We're going to hold on to that clip for Tonight sure. Tonight we'll find out what I just meant. <laughs> All right, but let's talk about your podcast, Clear and Vivid. It's available everywhere. Yes, a Apple uh, Podcasts and Stitcher. And I, I, you know, an awful lot of people, especially people who, who really like my podcast, don't know how to get it. <laughs> <laughs> how do you explain that in a sentence? I, my father still hasn't heard it. Mine. I have one, too. And I'm just like, Dad, this is how you do it. It's, it's, it's a, it's a you struggle. you got to, like, hand him the phone with it playing. Basically. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Basically, I handed him a phone a year ago. It's still playing right now on a loop right now <laughs> somewhere in Florida. I hope he likes that one episode. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's great. Here's the thing. And this is what I love. And I often talk about on my show here, the what's so wonderful about 2019. And there's a lot of negativity going around in the yeah. world, and, and rightfully so. But what I love about it is exactly what you're doing. So in all the movies and TV shows and everything that you've done, 
we've never had a chance to experience Alan Alda as close and as intimate as we can right now with the Clear and Vivid podcast. And that's what I love about it. Well, and I, and it goes along with what you just said about how not only are things negative, but we don't seem to have an impulse to communicate with one another, to relate to one another with respect, with curiosity. What is this person trying to say? Is there anything in it that actually has some value? Yeah. And the show is dedicated to that in an entertaining way. We talked to wonderful people, a wide range of people, Sarah Silverman, Itzhak Perlman, Yo-Yo Ma, uh, all, all kind of the, the chief negotiator for hostages for the FBI. And he, and he says his techniques for negotiating for a hostage release can, uh, can be very useful in a marriage. <laughs> Same techniques. <laughs> It's the same thing. Yeah. yeah. And you got to hear the episode to find out what he means by that. <laughs> he doesn't mean that one of them is a hostage, I don't think. Well, in my marriage, but yeah. <laughs> which I'll one of you? My wife for that one. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe the one you don't think. <laughs> well, since my kids came along, me. I'm a trampoline and a hostage all at the same time. That's for sure. <laughs> How old are your kids? <laughs> Four and two. Oh, wow. That's yeah. Weird. All ages are great, but I can picture those ages very well. Yeah, yeah. It's a crazy age. But you know what, though, I love about your podcast is not only your your one-on-ones and your interviews, but you also, I listened to one where you sort of, it was like a compilation episode where you kind of put everything together. and Yeah, we, we, we were talking about what our favorite uh, shows were, interesting moments in shows. Yeah. And we've done a couple of those. We did a very long a preview of this coming season. Yeah, that's, that's up today. It's on the on the internet today, and uh, it it goes on for about forty minutes because <laughs> we got really interested in the shows that are coming up. Yeah, and it's it's kind of interesting. Those shows, even though they're snatches of things that have usually already been played, they're some of our most popular because we we pull together things that interest us and say why. Yeah. And so it's another it's a discussion on a discussion which is kind of interesting. Well, and I love it too because you do have a lot of great discussions and you said you had some themes and your episode on empathy and why we can't get along one with one another. One of the most popular episodes was um, a, a psychologist who wrote a book called Against Empathy and he makes the case against empathy during our conversation, and I make the case for it. And what was wonderful about it was it was a really good example of two people empathically listening to one another. (laughs) And by the end of the show, there was hardly anything we disagreed on. (laughs) So you kind of won in a sense. Not really. We both won, which is the the empathic uh, hoped-for result. That's true. That's actually pretty true. But where did you, I mean, you know, in in your career, you don't need to be doing this. So where did the idea come from and what was your desire to do it? In a way, I do need to be doing it to feel alive. Yeah? Yeah, because I'm... uh, I'm ve- I, I'm very curious, and it's true. I could sit at home and just play cards on my computer, which I also work into the whole plan. <laughs> Still have time for that. I, you know, when I was 16, I figured out what how my life would go. I thought I was very smart. I figured the whole thing out. Moderation in all things, especially moderation. <laughs> So that allows for peaks and valleys and intense work and intense play or just sitting there and staring into space. Nice. But um, I I really do want to do things. It makes me happy to do things. But you could have done it. I mean, you still continue to act. You could do anything. Why did you hone in on a podcast? Well, I found my life pointing in a direction I didn't expect. From the time I was a young actor, I was interested in improvisation and always interested in science. And I realized when I did a science program for 11 years on public television that I was combining everything I knew. I was interviewing the scientists as a kind of improvisation where we had a really, truly conversational approach to the interview. It wasn't a regular interview. It's more like what you're doing right now. It's spontaneous. You don't have a list of questions. You're just talking, conversing. Yeah. And I realized we could, I could probably be helpful if I helped scientists learn how to do that so they could make their science available to the rest of us without jargon, without confusing us, right? getting us to come to the wrong conclusion because we don't follow what they're saying, that kind of thing. 
So I helped start the Center for Communicating Science at Stony Brook University, not far away. Mm -hmm. And in the past 10 years, we've trained 15,000 scientists and doctors around the country and around the world. Wow. So the podcast is a natural outgrowth of that because I realized it wasn't just scientists and doctors who needed to communicate better. It was all of us. And on the podcast, we have musicians, comedians, um, that FBI guy. (laughs) (laughs) We have all kinds of people who are expert at communicating in different ways. Judge Judy, you know, you don't you don't expect some of these people. You don't think of them as communicators sometimes, but they have techniques that we can all use. Yeah. So I I feel it's a way that I found that I can be helpful and have fun. I have the best time doing this podcast. Yeah. I enjoy it almost more than anything I've ever done. <laughs> I just love it. Yeah, because it's you. You know, again, the great thing about this is no matter how big a fan we are of your work, you know, uh, and it's certainly acclaimed, this is the most, I feel like this is the closest we can ever get to you is through this medium because you're giving your honest opinion on everything. Well, I'm more than I guess I do give my opinion, but I'm I'm really trying to put it in the form of a question most of the time. I'm trying yeah. to trying to figure things out, and I talk to people who really do have some interesting answers and interesting stories. You know, Sarah Silverman, who's still the highest rated podcast we've done. She was the first one we talked to. She had this amazing story where somebody tweeted to her, a one-word tweet that was a very insulting word, One of the, <clears throat> probably the most insulting thing you can say to a woman. Mm-hmm. And instead of blocking him or calling him out, she wrote back to him in a, in a message and said, you sound like you're in pain. Wow. Why don't you try to speak from a place of love? He said, I can't talk from love. That was ripped out of me by an abuser when I was a child. Oh, God. She kept communicating with him, found out he needed psychiatric help but couldn't afford it. Mm. She arranged for him to get it for free. Wow. And now they are friends online and communicate all the time. When I interviewed her, she had just been chatting with him online. Really? Isn't that an amazing story? That's an story? amazing story. I mean, she, she really risked a lot, put herself out there talking to a person who expressed hate toward her. Right. And she didn't return it in the same way. Right. That's amazing. It, it, there's something weird. You know, it's funny. You can attribute a lot of issues in the world to a lack of communication. You yeah. Know? Oh, I, oh I, an awful lot. I feel like a lot, even like, even on a small scale, like a workplace, a lack of yes. communication could yeah. really. And we've taught, we've taught, we've adapted our uh, science training in communication to the workplace. Right. And we've done um, sessions for women in business. Because in the workplace, of course, they have an even tougher job with communication because of stereotypes that are directed toward them. Sure. And it, it, you're right. It, it, there's, I mean, economists have come to us and said, help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because especially, especially when you're dealing with science, economy, difficult subjects, translating that language so that everybody can understand it. That's a huge undertaking to do. It really is. One of the toughest is mathematicians. And one of my, my, one of my dreams is to figure out a, a workshop for mathematicians that really helps them communicate with the rest of us because they, they truly talk a different language. Yeah. You mentioned something a second ago about improv, and I was listening to your preview for season five. You have Pat Metheny on. Yeah. He, he had... You know, it's funny because I, I love improv, too. We're like Dave Matthews Band, jazz, like, you know, we see it in music all the time. It's one of the things I love. But hearing him talk about improv and how much is set in place. Right. How much discipline is required. So fascinating. Wasn't that interesting? He said, you, 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 no matter who it is, no matter how great the improviser musically is, that doesn't mean at every performance you throw out all the forms you've derived over years of playing. Right. But yeah. within those forms... Uh, you have all the room in the world to come up with fresh stuff. Yeah, which is unbelievable. So what was it for you early on? You said you recognized, was it music? Was it comedy? Was there something? No, that- well, I, as a young actor, I joined an improv troupe that was produced by one of the people who started the whole improv movement in the country. His name was David Shepard. Mm-hmm. He started improv in Chicago with uh, Paul Sills. And 
we did in a basement in Hyannisport, in the basement of a hotel. We had a cabaret where we did a show every night. Half the show was set, sketches derived from improv and rehearsal. Right. And the second half of the show was totally pull your pants down, scare the world. <laughs> <laughs> totally fresh improv. Right. I, before the intermission, I say, give us words or ideas or subjects, and we'll come out and we'll do a, an hour show for you. Wow. So for 15 minutes backstage, we say, you, you wear that wig, you be that character, I'll be this character. And we didn't know what we were going to do when we got out there. It was guts improvising. And I loved it. And it was for the purpose of comedy. But then I studied improv, um, which was uh, from, uh, invented by Viola Spolin, uh, which is very pure work, and it's not for the purpose of comedy. But what it does is it brings you together. You have contact with one another where you must listen and you must pay attention for a scene to take place. And the scene is not always funny, but often it's hilarious because it's spontaneous, and spontaneity makes us chuckle. Yeah. So I, with that behind me, I realized if I taught that to scientists first— get them accustomed to really connecting and really finding out, reading your face, finding out if you're paying attention, if you're, if you're following them, or if they said something that makes your face cloud over. A simple thing like that gets them used to thinking about what you're going through when they talk to you, and that's empathy and what scientists call theory of mind. What are, what are you thinking? What are you feeling? Yeah, that's amazing. And that's the basis of it. And if you start with that and build out from there, in terms of what you want to express, what ideas you want to express, you don't just figure out the best way to say the ideas. You figure out how you can say the ideas in terms of what this person is capable of picking up. Yeah, because it's that, I feel like it's a, that innate nature in us to communicate and to connect with other people. Like that's, I think it is. Yeah. I think it, uh, because we're herd animals in a way, we're group, we're social animals anyway. Yeah, yeah. I think we're actually herd animals. Yeah. I, I eat like a herd animal, that's for sure. I saw you out on the on the field before. <laughs> it was grazing. It was, we're just grazing. Yeah, pay no very, mind to that. That's very a, nice. <laughs> that's a daily morning routine here. It's not a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> Alan Elder is with us here. Um, uh, Laura Brown tonight, Guildhall, guildhall.org for tickets. So first time you're ever doing the podcast live. That's we did, exciting. We did a, I did a, an interview with Tina Fey at the World Science Festival, but that was what, before I'd had the podcast. So it wasn't done as a podcast. We, we retooled it for the podcast. Right. This is the first one we're doing knowing that it's a podcast. That's crazy. All right. So when you decide podcast, like I want to know because I, um, I, you know, out of all my favorite episodes, the one with Mark Maron that you did was awesome. That was great. And yeah. he's one of the sort of the fathers of the of the medium there. So he, did he's you responsible for how many podcasts are? You know how many podcasts there are in the world? <laughs> I think more than people, actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Some, some people have six. <laughs> About close to 700,000 I've read. Wow. Podcast, individual podcast. Wow. So to have a podcast that anybody listens to is a big achievement. It's a huge achievement. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We've had almost five million downloads. I'm so proud of it. That's extraordinary. Yeah. So what? Tell me about the Mark Maron. S well, yeah, I love that episode because um, for several reasons. But I was wondering if you, when you decide, okay, it's going to be a podcast. That's what I'm doing. Did you go to his first? Like, what were the first couple that you checked out? He had interviewed me. Um, on his podcast, and I, he, he did such a wonderful job. I knew I wanted him on. I know he was probably among the first we asked on. But did you study other podcasts? Like, did you? Because I in the in the Mark Maron episode, you reference his interview with President Obama at the that time. That was an amazing interview. It was a moment in time for the medium because yeah. you have a sitting president literally just giving a blessing to this is a serious medium. And now. there was something about the way Mark could relate to the president. Yeah. That enabled the president to be more truly himself, or at least sound more truly himself than I had ever heard him before. I, I, th I thought I'm almost listening to a different person. Yeah. And they and they and you guys brought up an important issue about that episode, too, because it wasn't political in nature. It wasn't partisan. No, it was really just a, a tackling of issues, which is so hard um, uh, Bernie Sanders was on Joe Rogan's podcast and I brought it up for the same exact reasons. I was like, here's a great episode where it's not partisan, but it's people just exchanging ideas and talking about what the issues really are. 
in yeah. a long form nature. I know. Don't you wish that the political speech making were more like that? I, I certainly do. Totally. I mean, you hear the same words over and over again. I'll fight for you every single day. Well, first of all, may, maybe fighting is not the best way to go about it. Yeah. <laughs> Secondly, every single day, what about those days when you're in Hawaii on the beach? <laughs> <laughs> Let's get serious about this thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, see, my issues come from where journalism is today because, and this was kind of brought up on that episode where, you know, you're on CNN or you're on ABC and it's great to have that communication in a huge form, but you can't, so, to, to, you know, Take a, a word from Bernie here. You can't tell people how you're going to solve the world's issues in 45 seconds. Yeah. We're on right. a podcast. You have an hour long conversation to sort and of do that. And you can get that. into more nuance. You can get into. Yeah. Instead of here's what I'm going to do for you. Here's how hard it is. Maybe we should try this and maybe we should do that. And, yeah. And it, it, it might take longer than we think. But. The way the, the the format for making a political speech doesn't include any of that. No, and it's all for soundbite, and it's yeah. you know, and that's why I love the podcast form because you can literally dive into that. You know, it may not be easy for a Democrat to listen to a Republican talk or vice versa, but I think it's sort of the best medicine if you get them on a podcast or a long form conversation to really learn sort of the way Sarah Silverman did what that other side is yeah, like. Yeah, right. You know, right. I'd, it. It's a look into who the person really is, because you have the time. Right. And you can say anything you want. I, mean, yeah. <laughs> I was interviewing gonna... a priest who, uh, who runs a, a company to help, help homeless people and people out of jail start up businesses and be self-sufficient. And he had, he had a story that I loved. And I said, tell that story. He said, can I say that on the radio? Because <laughs> it had a it had a bad word in it, right? But it, but it was charming to hear him tell the story. Yeah, and it didn't matter because it's a podcast. Well, it's hard to ask you what your favorite is, but what you know what you know. I, people have asked me that. I don't have a favorite. I I can't even remember all of them. <laughs> I, it's true. You know, they're so improvisational. Yeah, I don't go in with a list of questions. I I have a piece of paper with ten things I'm curious about. But I never look at it during the during the conversation, and I look at it later and I realize I've covered every one because <laughs> there are things I want to know. You and me both. Here's my little. Hey, Did I, you? I, I, I see. Even, you, have, you have to reach for it. Yeah, I don't even have ten, and yeah. I don't think I've looked at it no, once you haven't yet. Haven't looked at it once. <laughs> look at it now. Is there anything right, you forgot? Let me see. Yeah. Uh, oh, there's yeah, one. That there's I didn't one. Get Why to. is this print so small? <laughs> No, I loved your I loved your talk with Adam Driver. Oh yeah. Is it easier or harder for you to talk with somebody that's in your same line of work? No, I love it because I want to hear what their version of the experience is in terms of acting and what they bring to it. And he's an extraordinary actor. Yeah. I think he, I, I've never seen him not be amazing and in play and playing Parts that are very different. We're both in a movie together. It's, it's called uh, uh, Marriage Story, and it's coming out at the end of the year. I just saw the trailer. He's just the, just the, the trailer. He's spectacular. It's just <laughs> wonderful. And 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 he and we talked a lot about how he was a Marine for several years. Yeah. And is uh, giving back to the military with a program he has to bring arts to the military, and. Uh, I, I have a soft spot now because of him for Marines. There was there were two Marines at a restaurant sitting behind me, and they had the waiter bring me a beer, and they said the Marines said to give you the beer and thank you for your service. They oh, said to you're me, kidding me, really? <laughs> <laughs> so I went over and I, we chatted for a couple of minutes. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, no, it was really good because, again, communication. I had heard that he was doing something, but until your podcast, I didn't know exactly what it was. Oh yeah, he he does readings of plays, and also for for military personnel around the country and I think around the world. Yeah, and uh, he also um, d d has a program where he encourages them to write plays, not necessarily about the military experience. You just write a play, and he's combining the arts and the military experience, and he feels it's helping both worlds. Yeah. Yeah. Many of them have never seen a play before. I know. It was crazy to hear him say yeah. that. Yeah. 
Because and plays are great because you again you have that connection with a character, with an actor, whatever it is. Yeah, you know, you're and, those. and and the whole it, it must be very moving for him because the whole idea of what a play is that goes back to the Greeks, where people went to an amphitheater and saw the life of another person lived out virtually, mm. and through that reenactment of a hard time in that person's life, you get some strength or insight into your own life. That idea has almost disappeared. I mean, we have a trivial version of it with sitcoms. Right. You know, yeah. I, always, I always thought if a million monkeys on a million typewriters had a million years, they'd come up with the works of Shakespeare. But for the first hundred thousand years, they'd do sitcoms. <laughs> With apologies to the sitcom writers out yeah. there. <laughs> that's pretty funny. Yeah, that's really, really funny. Well, that's, again, another great thing about the world today. You have some of these in-depth series on Netflix and, you know. Amazing. This is really a golden age, isn't it? It really, really is. It really in is. In fact, this movie is a Netflix movie. That, that uh, The one that you and Adam did? Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. I can't wait to see that. What was it? Marriage Story? Marriage Story. All right. I'm going to keep and, my uh, Noah Baumbach directed it, and he's he's extraordinary. He seems to know what he's doing. Yeah, yeah. he's pretty good. He's a pretty good guy. Um, who have you not been able to get on the podcast yet that you've been chasing for a little while? We asked Michelle Obama, but she she was busy on a book tour, so she was it was very hard. Okay, to, for her to to get her. But I, pretty much everybody we've asked has has been very eager to be on. Yeah, and the list is crazy. Melinda Gates is one that's coming oh, up that, that I'm looking so forward good. to. What a good she's such a good conversationalist and storyteller. Yeah, it's fascinating the stuff she's gone through. You know, she doesn't just have this big, expensive foundation that doles out money. She goes to Africa and lives in the hut with the families. Really, and finds out what they really need, not what she thinks they need. Wow, it's she's an extraordinary person. They both are. And even yeah, Warren yes, Buffett, they are. that whole yeah. thing about giving yeah. the money away is, is yeah. I feel like, I wish. How do you, I mean, you have to be the couple of the richest people in the world to, to make the case convincingly that other billionaires should give away half their money before they go. Yeah, I know. But yeah, they really, but they do. They do in it. Yeah. 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 It's kind of crazy. And, and to be organized about it and thoughtful about the way you give it away. It's yeah. the next big task because you can you can give it away in ways that don't really help the the big problems. Right, and you're speaking of giving, you're giving all the proceeds from your podcast. They're going oh, right. Yeah, yeah. I I always forget to say that because it, it's it's a good thing to let people know. We have advertising on the podcast, and all the proceeds that we get go to the Center for Communicating Science. So I, I so I always say at the end of the show, just by listening to this show, you're making better communication happen. Yeah, no joke, that actually made me feel better. I'm no not kidding, even going to lie. Really? Yeah, I swear to God. Oh, yeah. no kidding. Because in those moments, you feel kind of useless and you're just listening to the no, thing. You're, listening. And you're, 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 you're devoting your time to listen to the commercials, which we try to make as entertaining yeah. as we can. <laughs> they are good, yeah. My, yeah. my associate producer, uh, Sarah Chase, her job is to make fun of me. <laughs> and she doesn't seem to have much of a problem doing that. <laughs> You give well, you know, you're giving her a lot of material. That's what yeah, you're being right, open. That's right. That's that's my task is to give her material. Yeah, that's that's why I'm like this. <laughs> did they did they show you the mechanics of a podcast? Because you seem to kind of take to it right away. I've always loved radio. When I was a kid in college, I had uh, two radio shows. Well, I did a record show, a front row center, a oh, front and center at at a Broadway show, and I play an album of Broadway music. And then I wrote radio plays, 15-minute plays, and I directed them. Wow. I loved it. There's something about being in a studio and having a microphone in front of you and knowing there's somebody at the other end of that, but you don't know who it is. Yeah. It's a very interesting feeling. What do you think when you sit in front of the microphone? Uh, please don't get fired during this break. That's what I'm mostly <laughs> thinking these days. <laughs> you know, that's a that's a real worry. I was I was in a couple of Broadway shows where they almost closed during intermission. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it's a real. The struggle's real. Yeah, yeah. yeah you it's never know. <laughs> no, I have the same excitement too. Uh, that's that same thrill and the connection. You know, there's something about it where you're in somebody's ear. Yeah. You know, there's nothing, there's no barrier. And you assume you're welcome. 
<laughs> well, some of us more than others, Alan. Well, the dial allows you th- them to make that happen. That's true. Yeah. That's very, very true. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about uh, Guild Hall. Um, it's an extraordinary place. You'll be there tonight. Yeah. I would it, love to know your impression. I know you've been involved I've you know, been for, for years. many years. I've gone to Guild Hall to, uh, to be enlightened, to have fun, to see people say things that I, I hadn't thought about before. It's it's a wonderful place. They the 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 board there. I'm not on the board, but I know people who are, and I know that they're serious about making it a, a center for enlightenment and entertainment. Yeah, in, in our in this area, and it's really it's really one. It's a wonderful place. Uh, this was an absolute thrill of a lifetime for me. For me too. I'm, <clears throat> I've been looking forward to this since I was 11. <laughs> Doesn't matter that that's a joke. That'll be in the promo as a serious uh, statement. So. <laughs> as it should be. <laughs> uh, Alan Alda, How to Be a Badass tonight with Laura Brown from In Style. Should be really great. Guildhall.org for tickets. Uh, it starts at 8 p.m. Starts at 8 p.m. That's guildhall.org for tickets. Thank you so much. Well, it was really fun talking with you. Thank you. I appreciate that so much. Thank you, Alan. I, I loved it.